I want to spend the next couple of minutes in our time together just talking about one simple idea, uh, yet it's profound, it's powerful, and the idea we're going to talk about, it's it's not something new, okay? This is not like earth-shattering, you know, new information where you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I've never heard that before. In fact, I would venture to guess that most, if not all of you who are watching this have probably heard this idea somewhere before, but listen, this idea, it has the potential to change everything for you. It has the potential to change your life. It has the potential to change your faith. It has the potential to change the way that you see yourself, the way that you see God, the way that you see other people, the way you see and engage and interact with the world around you. If what we're going to talk about, if this idea is true, that it is the most significant idea in human history. And that idea is simply this, that God loves you. Like that's it. Like God, God loves you. And it just seems like so basic. It seems so like, what, what, what? That's it? Like, Phil, there's got to be more than that. But before we, before we rush past that, before we jump into the text, and before we nuance it, because we're going to talk about how, what's that look like and all those kind of things. But, but just let that sit for a minute. That God loves you. That if you're someone who is like a believer, you're a Christian, you're like a faith person, let it settle in that that God that you claim to worship loves you. And if you're someone who's skeptical, like, let it settle in for a second that like, if there is a God, can you allow yourself to believe that he is the kind of God that would actually love and care about you personally? I think sometimes it's really easy to think of an idea like that and be like, oh, that's just, that's just soft and mushy and kind of emotional. It's like, um, it's maybe easy to think, well, that's kind of childish, or it's, it's very, that's just surfacy. Like, can we just talk, we gotta, go, we gotta go deep. But I would argue that like, the idea that God loves you is one of the deepest things that a human being can possibly ponder. That God loves you. And for some of you, you you've heard this statement like so many times that it's actually become mundane. It's become boring. You've allowed it to become ordinary to you. For others of you, maybe you would say, um, I'm a little skeptical of this idea that God loves me. That could be for a variety of reasons. I mean, it could be that you say, I I don't know that I can believe that God loves me. It's like, I believe that God loves. I just don't know that he could love me. You know, because, well, I, 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 I've just... I'm just too messed up. You know, I've got too much in my past. I've got too much in my present. I, I've, I've just got too much garbage, too much that I've done, too much been, has been done to me. I don't think God could love me. Or, or maybe I, just, I feel like, you know, I, I, my faith isn't strong enough. I don't believe enough yet for God to love me. Maybe you're skeptical and you would say something like, well, I, I don't believe that God, especially the Christian God, loves people. Seems like a jerk. You know, he seems like vindictive. He seems judgmental. He seems... Uh, he seems hateful, so I, I don't know that I buy that. Or maybe you're someone who's just skeptical of the whole thing, and you're like, I, I don't even know, like, I'm not even sure that I believe the whole God thing, so how can I believe that God loves me if I don't really know what I believe about God? Now, all those things are legitimate. If I can be honest, I've been, in my life, I, I've, I've, I've been in all three of those places at various points of time, you know, and you kind of go in and out between those things, like, I don't, do, do I believe this? Am I sure about this? For the next few minutes, I want us to try to set apart, set aside our skepticism or our familiarity with the idea, and, and I, I want you to kind of try to forget about all the things you think you know, the things you think you've heard, or you've been told about this, and, and to the best of our ability, I want us to hear these words, to hear this idea, to look at the passage that we're going to look at um, as it was first heard and received by its original audience. To put ourselves like back in the first century and be like, when, when these words were penned, when they were circulated around, when people began to read and grasp this idea, what, what did it mean to their world and how did they receive that? When people first heard the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That, that is, that's so familiar to so many of us. We, we've heard this verse. We've seen it so many times. People hold it on signs at sporting events and in crowds. People, I mean, we just bumper stuff. I mean, this, this idea is everywhere. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 John 3, 16. But how would that have been received the first time someone ever heard this idea? John 3, 16. We've been uh, journeying through the Gospel of John together. Um, over the past several weeks. And John is, uh, it's, it's just, man, we gotta, we gotta get this idea that John isn't just writing a book. He's not, John has no concept of like, I'm writing the Bible right now. Like, that, like, it's not, like he had no idea there would be a Bible. 
Like John is writing down, he, he's, he's one of Jesus' first followers, he's one of the disciples of Jesus. He's an eyewitness to the events, he hears the teachings, he sees the miracles. John is there, and later in John's life, he, he realizes, like, I need to document all of this so that it can be passed down to, to, the, to the next generation of Jesus' followers. So John sits down, and he, he records his account of the life, uh, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and we call it the Gospel of John. So we've been working through that. And last week, we, um, we looked at a conversation that Jesus had with a guy named Nicodemus. Uh, so Nicodemus uh, is, is a religious leader. He's a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law. And he goes to Jesus and begins to have this conversation with him. We got most of the way through it last week. We're going to kind of pick up and finish that conversation today. But Nicodemus goes to Jesus, and he's essentially wondering, hey, are you here to bring the kingdom of God? Are you bringing the kingdom of heaven? Are, 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 are you, you look like you're, you know, you're doing these things. You look like you might be the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the one who's going to bring God's kingdom. And God's kingdom, it's, it's the rule and reign of God. It's the will of God being done. It's, it's his rule and reign, his goodness, his justice, his mercy, his love, like just permeating every part of life. Uh, it, it, it's, it's life in the age to come as opposed to uh, life now where there's this, this kingdom of darkness and there's sin and there's death and there's pain and there's suffering. It's like, are, wait, are you, are you ushering in the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God when all that other junk goes away? And, and Jesus begins to have this really interesting conversation with Nicodemus and he says, listen, if you want to, if you want to see that kingdom, if you want to see like life in the age to come, um, if you just want to even be able to perceive it as it's happening around you, you want to see it, you want to enter into it, you want to experience kingdom life in your own life, then Nicodemus, that means you need to be born again. That, that for people to enter into the kingdom, they need to be born again. They're like not physically born again, but there needs to be a second kind of birth, a spiritual birth, a supernatural something that happens within a person that needs to take place. And so it's within the context of that con conversation that we find these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, it's, it's, I, I find it interesting. The little word that uh, in many translations gets translated as so, it's the Greek word hutos. But it actually, it, it doesn't refer to the extent of something. That's kind of how we read it. For God so loved the world. Like, oh my gosh, it was so much. But that's not really what it means. Uh, it doesn't refer to the extent of God's love, but rather the way in which God loved. So it's not really for God so loved the world, it's for God loved the world in this way. This is how he loved. This is what it looked like. This is what happened. And so, yeah, there, there's an implication of he loved the world so much, but you get that impl implication, not just because of a feeling or God loves so much, but because of what he did, that he loved in this way, we know that he loved the world. So John, he's not talking about a feeling. John is talking about an event. He's talking about something that happened in history. He's saying, I was there. I saw it with my own two eyes. I saw God, how God loved the world, and this is how it went down. And this actually becomes the answer to a question that Nicodemus had asked several verses before. Right? So Nicodemus is there. He's asking Jesus. He's talking to him. He's like, hey, are you bringing the kingdom? And Jesus is like, well, if you want to see the kingdom, you've got to be born again you got to be born of water and spirit. There's got to be a second birth. And, and Nicodemus is like, I don't get it. And he says, how can this be? What do you mean? How can someone be born again, being born of the spirit and water and spirit? He's like, I'm, I'm so confused. Um, and then that's kind of where we left off last week. A couple of verses after this, Jesus kind of lovingly calls Nicodemus out. And he's like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, you're supposed to be a Pharisee, a teacher, a religious leader. How, how are you not getting this? And that's kind of where we ended things off. And now we're going to pick things back up with Jesus answering this question of Nicodemus. How can this be? You're talking about being born again. To enter the kingdom, you've got to be born again. How can this be? So picking up in verse 14, this is what Jesus says to Nicodemus. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. <laughs> Wait, time out. I thought we were talking about being born again and, and, and entering into the kingdom. Now we're talking about snakes, okay? Like, what do you mean we're talking about snakes? Am I, Phil, are you about to bring snake out? Are we that kind of church? We're not that kind of church, okay? So everybody, breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief. You, I will never be handling a snake. I don't like snakes, okay? But it's like, Jesus, you're talking about snakes. What, what Moses and snake. How did we get from being born again in the kingdom of heaven to Moses and snakes? Let me pull back and try to give us some context again. So remember, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee. He's a religious leader. He's a teacher. He is an expert 
in the Old Testament, Old Covenant law. So what we would call our Old Testament um, to the Jewish people, it's just the Jewish scriptures. It's the Hebrew Bible. So Nicodemus as a Pharisee, he would have had like the entire thing committed to memory. And there is this strange kind of event that happens with Moses lifting up a snake. And so what Jesus is doing is he's reaching back into the Old Testament. He's reaching into the Jewish scriptures to, pull, to bring something to the surface that would have been so familiar to Nicodemus. To say, listen, you're not, you're not getting the whole being born again and how this is going to happen. Let me draw a connection point to something that you know and something that you understand. You remember that one time with Moses in the desert and there's the snake and Nicodemus goes, ah, yeah, I know that time. And so what exactly is Jesus talking about? Uh, th this is found in Numbers 21. If you want to go and check it out sometime, we're not going to turn there. I'm just going to kind of give us an overview. Numbers 21 uh, in the Old Testament. So what's going on is Israel, the nation of Israel is wandering around in the desert. God has rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. So that's the whole Moses and the plagues and let my people go. Um, and, he, and he's calling them out and saying, you're, you're going to be my people. I've saved you. I've rescued you. I've redeemed you. Let's set up some rules and some guidelines for how this relationship's going to work. And they're supposed to enter into the promised land. But because of their, their lack of faith in God, because of their rebellion and their sin, um, it, it turns out that that generation ain't going to get to enter into the promised land, that they're going to have to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. And then when that generation all passes away, their kids will get to go into the promised land. And so during this 40-year wandering, a lot of things happen. And one of the things that happens is this strange story with these snakes. And so the nation of Israel, they're, they're complaining about everything. They're whining. They're grumbling against God. They continue to sin against God and be enticed to chase after other gods. And they're full of sin. They're rebelling. All these kind of things. This is bad. This is bad news. And so God sends poisonous snakes into their camp. Uh, so they, they were a portable people at this time, right? They're wandering around. They pitch their tents. They set up camp for a while. And snakes start coming in. They're venomous snakes. And they start biting people. And people start getting infected. You know, you know, the, the venom gets through them. They get poisoned. And they die. And so the people start crying out. They're like, oh, no, God, save us, save us, save us. So God hears their, their pleas. And he, he tells Moses, here's what you do. You make a bronze snake. So you fashion this, this image of a snake out of metal. And you put it on a pole. So you put it so it's on something that will be way up in the air, right? Snake on a pole. You heard of snakes on a plane, but have you heard of snakes on a pole? You have now, okay? So he puts a snake on a pole, uh, and he says that, that anyone who gets bitten by a snake can look to the snake on the pole, and then they'll be saved. Like, they'll, they'll, they'll be healed. They'll be restored. They'll be redeemed, and they're going to live. It is a wild story. I mean, it's crazy to think about. And it, it, what it does, though, and this is important. This is going to be important for our conversation, right? It points to the upside down and surprising ways in which God works. Because, listen, the very thing that was killing them, that was infecting them, the thing that was, that was causing the death and destruction in their camp, God actually turns that on its head and uses that very thing as a symbol for, for what's going to save them. Right? And so it's this upside down, like, God, are you kidding me? You use the thing that's actually killing the people to be the symbol for the thing that's going to save the people. And so it just, it, it, it causes them to just go, God, you, you're amazing. Because there's no way that we in our own human minds would think, I know, a snake. Like, we wouldn't put the snake on the pole because the snake is what's killing us. So God's like, I want you to know that it's all me, and I can take this thing that's destroying you, and I can actually use it to be part of the thing that's saving you, okay? So keep that filed away. So Jesus, he brings this story that Nicodemus will be really familiar with, Moses and the snake on the pole, and the people look at the snake, lift it up on the pole, and they're like, okay, we're saved, we're good, it, we're healed. He says, in just that same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Son of Man is one of the kind of prophetic titles um, that had been you know, talked about for the Messiah when he would come in the, in the, Old, in the Old Testament. And it's, and it's the one that Jesus actually embraces and uses most often for himself. So he's talking to himself. So it says, he's saying, look, I need to be lifted up. I need to be lifted up. Uh, that, that phrase, lifted up, John uses it five times in his gospel. And every single time John uses the phrase lifted up, it is a reference to the cross. It is a reference to the, to the, to the bloody crucifixion of Jesus. It is a reference to pain and suffering and death of, of, of the, the, the Son of Man, the Son of God, God in a human body being killed is when John says, lift it up. And so here, here's the picture that Jesus is painting. Nicodemus, if you, if you want to see and enter and experience the kingdom, to do that, you're going to be, need to be born again. And to be born again, you need to look to the Son of Man who is lifted up on a cross. And Nicodemus says, going to understand this at this point, because Jesus hasn't been lifted up on a cross yet. And it's interesting, actually, like, 
you know, John, as he's writing this, in hindsight, he's reflecting on this. Nobody had any clue what Jesus is talking about right here. They're all like, okay, whatever, lift it up. What does that mean? The snake. And, but later, they're like, oh, my gosh. Now we get what he's saying. And so there's this, this, this beautiful picture here. So listen, like, just as the snakes were the things that were killing the Israelites, it was a poison that was getting in and just destroying them. Like in the picture with Jesus that, that sin is the thing that is killing us. Like sin is the infection. Sin is the thing that's gotten into the camp and is killing everybody. It is a poison that kills everything it touches. Right? It, 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 it spreads, it destroys. Like from the very beginning, that is what sin does. Man, It destroys, it breaks down, it kills every good thing in our life. Like sin at its, at its root, it it kills relationships. It destroys the relationship that we have with ourselves, the relationships we have with other people, the relationship that we have with God. Sin comes in and jacks it all up. Like, like sin is the reason, and it, it is the reason for uh, why we, we lose friendships. It's the reason for why marriages end. It's, for, it's the reason for why uh, parents and kids get estranged. It's the reason for why nations go to war. It's the reason why there's abuse and there's scandal and there's harm and there's all of these things. It's this infection that is spreading throughout humanity, just as the snakes were in the camp. And just as God, in in the story with Moses and the snakes, he used the snake, he used the thing that was killing them, and he flipped it on its head to be the symbol of the thing that would save them. In In the same way, in a similar way, he flips the power of sin on its head. You see, our sin is what's killing us. It's what's destroying us. Human sin is what's killing us, and human sin is ultimately what killed Jesus. My sin, your sin, the sin of humanity, the the Christian belief and claim is that it is the sin of human beings that put Jesus on a cross, that did the worst possible thing in human history. But because of the death of Jesus, because of what our sin did to him, we can now live. And so God flips the power of sin on its head. That the thing that, that's killing us, the thing that killed Jesus, it killed him, but because he died, we can live. And so the cross becomes this symbol of really the thing that was killing us, but it will now become the, the symbol of the thing that will save us. Because the, the cross is the picture of the worst of humanity. It is a picture of the worst of what human sin does. The human sin like shouts out to an innocent man, crucify him in the most bloody and humiliating and painful way possible. Like that is a picture of what my sin does. But then God turns that on its head and says, yes, this is a picture of how evil your sin is, but this will now become the picture of the thing that saves you. Man, it's, 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 it's the, the paradox. We look to the cross and we see this stark contrast, this, this paradox on, where on one hand, it is an instrument of torture and death, but yet it's also a symbol of life. And I think sometimes we lose that. We've, we so romanticize the cross in modern uh, just culture, you know, the kind of Christian culture. And, and, and I get why that's happened because it's this beautiful central piece of the faith, like, like, like the cross of Jesus, his death for our sin. But man, now we wear crosses on our clothes and we get cross tattoos and we have pieces of jewelry and it's like, yay, the cross. W- w- to John's first century audience, it was not that, right? Like they, they had seen crucifixions They had heard the screams. They had smelled the bodies rotting. They knew what this was. It was an instrument of terror and torture and death. And yet you look to it and you see the death that sin causes, but then you also now see life. It's the paradox of I look at the cross, and honestly, one of the things that the cross of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, should cause us to see is it should actually cause me to see how awful I am. They're like that is that is what that is how ugly my sin is. That is how messed up it is. That is how broken I am. And so on one hand, I see my brokenness, but then on the other hand, God flips that on his head and says, yes, but in spite of your brokenness and all the things that you've done and how jacked up you are and how messed up you are, what's happened to you or all of your baggage, in spite of all of that, I love you this much that I am hanging here naked, bleeding, dying. That's this upside down thing. So Jesus is, is saying this thing that Nicodemus can't even begin to grasp because this hasn't actually happened to Jesus yet. He's like, but man, just so you know, Nicodemus, you're gonna look back on this conversation and it's all gonna make sense to you someday. If you wanna have eternal life and, and, and you wanna have life in the kingdom, you need to, just as the Israelites look to the snake on the pole, you need to look to the son of man on a pole, lifted up on a cross. 
You want to see the kingdom? You want to be born again? Here's how it happens. Here's what I'm going to do. And now at this point, the conversation between um, Nicodemus and, and Jesus actually ends. But the next part that we're going to look at is actually John's commentary. So John is writing this as an old man. He's reflecting back on it, and he's, he's reflecting back on the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus and everything that had happened, and he's putting it down, and, and he's, he, he's providing his commentary where he pulls out of the narrative and says, now this is what it means. And as he thinks about this, this encounter that Jesus and Nicodemus has, as Jesus is talking about life in the kingdom and eternal life and being lit, the son of man being lifted up, John, John pulls out of that conversation and explains to you and I what it means. And if John were here with us, I think he would say, listen, now this isn't, this isn't something that I read about. This isn't something that I was told to believe as a child. This isn't something that I grew up believing. This isn't myth. This isn't fairy tale. Like this is something that I saw. I saw my teacher, my friend, my rabbi, my Lord. I saw him lifted up. And in light of everything that I saw and everything I experienced, in light of all of that, in light of what Jesus has just told Nicodemus with my kind of hindsight now and seeing and experiencing all of it, in light of all of that, the best way I can say it, the best way I can describe it, the only thing, like the, 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 to succinctly put this into words that us as humans can even comprehend, John would say, the best way I could think to say it is that God loved the world. God loved, like, he loved the world. When he talks about the world, he's talking about me and you. He's talking about people. He's talking about humanity. That God, he, he loves the people that he has made in his image. And he, how did he love him? He loved them in this way. That he gave his one and only son. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Life God loved, so he so he gave. And, and like sometimes we kind of, we're kind of like, okay, you got God giving Jesus the Son, and, and we kind of make a division there. But but the idea God is three in one, and so it's not God giving giving someone up His Son up that is external to Him. He is giving Himself. The God loved, so He gave Himself in, in the person of Jesus. He loved, so He gave. The, the God of the universe went to a cross and experienced the most excruciating pain because He thought you and I and every human being on the planet is worth that because He loves us. He loved, so He gave His one and only Son so that everyone. This is why the gospel, this is why the message of Jesus is good news because it is available to everyone or in the old king james of this whosoever that whosoever believeth that everyone anyone no matter who you are no matter what you've done no matter what's been done to you no matter where you were born or when you were born or what family you were born to none of that matters whether you're rich or poor you're young or old you're gay you're straight you're republican democrat liberal conservative black white red yellow purple orange like it literally doesn't matter everyone this, ex this invitation is extended to everyone, including those of you who are watching and listening to this who think you don't deserve it. To those of you that think you gotta get cleaned up first, that you have to somehow earn this. No, this is a gift for you. That, that, that he, he gave his son for everyone, including those of you who think, man, I don't even know if I believe this. This, this is the offer that is on the table. This is the thing, that the, the, the eternal life that we're gonna get to in a minute, that is the thing that is available to you because of the love of God and everyone. This is an all skate. Everyone has equal opportunity. Look to the Son of Man lifted up on a cross. That everyone, this is available to everyone. All you have to do is receive it. Like, just like the, the Israelites with the snake, that the snake was up on the pole to be their source of salvation. They just had to look to it. I mean, they could get bitten and choose not to look at the snake, but if they looked to it, they'd be saved. So this, this gift is available to everyone if you will just look to him, that everyone who believes, believes. There, there, there's this idea, and it's not, this is not a, a statement, that this is, this is not about intellectual agreement, because sometimes that's what we... Uh, sadly boiled it down to. I mean, I know, I, I know several people are like, yeah, I'm a Christian. But, but, but they're like, but when they, when they say that, what they mean is like, well, I believe that, I believe in a God. I believe in the Christian God and that, that Jesus, you know, died for my sins, rose from the grave. And maybe I prayed a prayer once saying that I believe that. But belief is just this intellectual idea to them. That's not what this is. And this is about trust. There's two different kinds of belief. There's believe that 
I believe that something is true. That's, that's intellectual. And then there's belief in. I believe in something. I believe in the fact that the stool I'm sitting on right now is going to hold me up, so I am sitting here. I have, it is, I have a trust. And when the New Testament talks about belief and faith, that's what it's talking about. It's trust. I, I, I trust in the son that God gave. I trust in the one who was lifted up. I, I, you've heard me say this before, but it's this idea of I'm leaning the weight of my life on this. I'm staking everything on this. Like there, there's, this carries the weight of like, I'm, I'm committing my allegiance to Jesus every day. There's this believing, this trusting. He says, anyway, everyone who does that, everyone who believes is going to receive something. They're going to receive this, this kind of great exchange, this trade out that they will not perish but they'll have eternal life. And the idea of perishing and eternal life, they're, they're kind of juxtaposed here. Uh, that, that perishing, this is the core of our problem. This is back to the idea of sin, that sin kills, it destroys. Just like the snakes that we're getting into the camp, uh, sin is a poison that it kills, it infects, it destroys. This idea is woven throughout the biblical narrative. Uh, the, the, that when all the way back at the beginning when humanity is given the choice to like follow God's ways or make their own ways and it's, it's presented in this picture of a fruit from a tree. Is it literal? Is it figurative? It doesn't matter. Like the, the point is the same. It's like when, if you choose to go your own way, like if you choose to eat, like the day you eat of it, you will die. Death and destruction will be entered, like will enter into the world. The Apostle Paul comes along in the book of Romans and says, yeah, it's like, it's like you're working for something in the wages of sin is death. Like, like we're on a path to perishing, but if you believe, you'll have eternal life. Like God's made for you, a way for you to have eternal life, and that's not just about a quantity of life, but it is about a quality of life. Like uh, not just, um, it's not just a, that you'll live forever, but it's the quality of that living forever. That's eternal life. It's not just about going to heaven when you die. It's about a quality of life that starts right now and actually that, that trajectory then continues on into eternity. This is, this is why Jesus comes along in John chapter 10. He says, like, here's what the thief does. Here's what sin does. It comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what sin does, man. It steals, it kills, and destroys every good thing in your life. But he says, I've come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly or have it to the full. Like, that you may have true, abundant, and full life. And listen, at the end of the day, that's what every single human being on the planet is looking for. You may not say it that way, but we are all looking for eternal life. We are looking for life that is truly life, life that is kind of an abundant kind of life. That's what we look for in our relationships, in our careers, with money, with sex, with what we wear, with what we eat, with how we dress. I mean, it's just like, like I am looking for something to, to give me a life that is truly life. We all have a longing for this idea of like the good life, the good life. Like there's, there's, there's a, something about like life of meaning and purpose and joy and delight. There is an idea, and actually it's this beautiful idea that's like programmed into us that we know instinctively that there is more to this life than often what we experience in this life. And so we go about looking for it. We go looking for that something more. It's like, ah, uh, there's, there's a fulfillment that I'm after that I can't quite get. There's a, there's a sense of, of, of purpose and joy and meaning and peace that, that, that I think should be out there. And so I'm, I'm on a pursuit for it. I'm on a pursuit for the good life and for eternal life. But Christianity comes along and says, listen, that's actually a good thing. That, 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 that desire in you is actually pointing to something. But here's the reality. You will only ever find that, that per, like the, the thing that satisfies that pursuit. You'll only ever find that by looking to the one who has been lifted up on a cross. For God so loved the world, he loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And then John actually, he nuances this just a little bit more. In verse 17, he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned but everyone who does not believe is already condemned because he's not believed in the name of the one and only son. He says, hey, God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus so you can have eternal life. And then he's like, let me, let me explain what, what this looks like. He says, God, like, Jesus didn't show up on the planet to condemn the world. 
He, he, came, he came to save the world. He didn't, Jesus didn't show up to shake his finger at you and me and say, you're terrible and you're awful. And don't you know that you're all a bunch of dirty, dirty sinners and you're just, you're bad. You're, like, you're horrible. Like, I'm, like, away from me. Like, that's not, that's not why Jesus showed up. He showed up to save. Like, he showed up to display grace and love and forgiveness. He, listen, Jesus didn't show up to condemn the world. Jesus doesn't need to condemn the world because why? He says, listen, because anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Jesus comes to save the world, not to condemn the world, because the world is already like in a state of condemnation. It is like the default setting. It is something went wrong all the way back in Genesis 3. God creates a beautiful world and sets it up for humans to, to be in relationship with him and there to be love and joy and life and peace and goodness and flourishing. And collectively, humanity gives God the big old middle finger and says, screw you, we want to do things our own way. And our own way leads uh, us down a path of death and destruction and condemnation. And so like that is the path that me and you and everyone are on. Like, like, like it wasn't just like, mm, I'm choosing a path. It's like, no, we are on a path that leads to destruction. Like it's this idea that's talked about sometime of like, you know, original sin <laughs> that people, like we are, we are messed up in our nature. Like there's something, something got messed up with like our default settings. We weren't meant to be this way, but this is just how all of us come out, like out of the factory settings with this glitch of like, I, I, know, the, the, like, I know the wrong things and those are the things I wanna do and I know the right things and I don't wanna do those and I wanna blow up my life and everybody else's life. Like we are on this path to destruction. It's actually, I think this is one of the easiest biblical claims to believe uh, because all you have to do is just look around. Like you, you look around at your, your neighbors and your family, you, look, you, you turn on the news, you scroll through social media. I mean, if we're being honest, just take a look in the mirror and it is really, really easy to believe this, that yeah, we are on a path towards destruction. We are on a path towards death and towards condemnation. And like, like uh, when left to our own devices, it's not good. When, when left to our own devices, when, when left to, like we have thousands of years of human history <laughs> and it's interesting that every time we kind of, we, we, we try to push away from like God's way and towards our own way. There has never been a track record of anything good happening, like ever. It's interesting, like we, we keep trying this, we keep pushing this like, yeah, I know, like there's these, these things about how life works and, and how everything works and God has set this up. But what if we didn't do that? Maybe it'll be different this time. And man, every single time, for all like the talk of progress that our secular culture likes to put forth, we are barreling towards destruction. One author put it this way. He said, the 20th century is the most barbaric in history. It makes the myth of progress read like a cruel joke. 160 million human beings slaughtered by their own kind in war. More people dying of starvation in a single decade than in all of history. The AIDS epidemic, the widening gap between the rich and the poor, the environmental crisis, the threat of nuclear holocaust, and the list goes on and on and on and on. We are on a path towards destruction. So Jesus doesn't come, man, he doesn't come to condemn the world. He doesn't need to do that because it's obvious. He comes to save the world, to, to, to pluck us off of that path that we are on and say, let me, you, you are barreling down a path that leads towards destruction. Let me divert you. Let me get you off of that path. If you'll humor me for a second and kind of let me draw a picture because I know you just love it whenever I draw things. But like, man, if, if, this, if this green line is like, you know, the, the, the path of humanity, okay, and it, it leads down the path of death, of destruction, of, uh, of condemnation, however you want to phrase that, and every single human being is on this path, right? Like, this is just the way we're going. This is just life. We are, we are moving down this path. And this, like, it, it, this is not something that it's, that that's where we're going to go someday, where condemnation and death and destruction, that's not some future reality. Like that's the world and the life that we're living in now, and it's a trajectory that we can choose to continue on or not. And Jesus steps into time and space at a point in history and plants a flag and says, I want to create a way for you like, to get off of that path. I am on a rescue mission. You are barreling towards destruction and I am coming to save. And the cross stands at this kind of intersection point in history. And from that point forward, you can, you can choose to continue down the path of death and destruction, or at the point of the cross, it creates a, a, like kind of an off-ramp. It creates another way, another path, and this is the path that leads to life. 
and understand the idea of the path that leads to eternal life, or the path that leads to condemnation, or the path that leads to uh, destruction or perishing. John 3, 16, will not perish, but will have eternal life. Those aren't some future reality pie in the sky, some disembodied idea of heaven or hell. It's the reality of the path that we are on right now. Am I, am I on a path that leads to life or one that leads to destruction? And I'm, in, I'm on that right now, and that will just continue on into eternity. Which path am I on? Right, Because the road that I'm on leads where that road leads. Like anytime you get on a road, if you stay on that road, you are going to end up wherever that road goes. And all, like the, the entire world, all of humanity, we are all on this path that just like, it's death, it's destruction, it's condemnation. And God says, no, 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 no. I love you. I love you. So I am on a rescue mission to do everything I can possibly do. I will go to the most extreme measures. I will go to a cross so you don't end up on a path of death and destruction that is like this eternal kind of death. I want you to experience eternal life, abundant life in the here and now and on into eternity that, that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He's on a rescue mission. He is chasing us down. He wants us to know him and enjoy him and experience eternal life here and now and on into eternity. Motivated by love. For God so loved the world. He loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God loved, so he gave. That's the God end of this kind of equation. He loved, so he gave. Now we believe and we receive. God loved, so he gave. We believe, so we receive eternal life. It's beautiful. It's simple. And as easy as it is to think, yeah, I've heard that, and that just seems trite. Like These are 25 words that rock the world. In the original Greek, there's, there's like 25 words here. 25 words that forever changed the world. 25 words that completely changed how people thought about God. The idea that a God was loving, that a God would sacrifice for people that he loved, it was a foreign concept in the ancient world. There were no other religious ideologies like this in the time of Jesus, and there are no other religious ideologies like this today. This is unique. In fact, one author, um, I found this fascinating. His name's Robert Wright. He wrote The Evolution of God. So he is not a Christian. He's not a follower of Jesus. He's a secularist. But he wrote this. He says, we can be pretty sure that the crucifixion of Jesus happened in part because it made so little theological sense. As the iconic Christian verse, John 3, 16, puts it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And as powerfully as these words ring now, imagine their impact in the ancient world. Throughout history, gods had been beings to whom you made sacrifices. Now here was a God that not only demanded no ritual sacrifices from you, but himself made sacrifices. Indeed, the ultimate sacrifice for you. He made the ultimate sacrifice for you. This changed the world. There there was nothing like this in the ancient world. This was not common. This was not normal. This was not, oh, yawn, I've heard that before. This was like, are you kidding me, John? God loved? God loved the world? There was nothing like this then. And honestly, there's nothing like it now. This this idea, the love of God demonstrated through the death of Jesus on a cross on our behalf, it, it changed the life of Jesus' first century followers. It changed the, it's, it's changed the life of literally billions of people throughout history. It has the power to change your life as well. God loves you. He loves you. Listen, I, I, I don't know you, the person on the other side of the screen, you're watching this, you're listening to this. I don't know you. I don't know your story. I don't, you, you, may, you may not even believe any of this, but what, what, but what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt not because of a feeling, but because of something that happened in history. You can put a flag on it. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you, that he spared nothing, not even himself, to demonstrate that love, to save you. He has done literally everything, but the only thing he won't do is force that love upon you. 
He's made a way for you to get off the path of destruction. And he's saying, hey, come this way. Come on, come on, come to me, come to me, come to me. Look to the Son of Man who's been lifted up. Come this way, give on this other path. But he's not going to run over there and, and drag you off of it and drag you onto the path of following him. See, that part is up to you. That part's up to me. That, that part is up to every single individual on the planet. And that is the invitation to recognize and see that God loved the world, that God loved you and God loved me. And so he gave his son. He gave himself up to be, to be sacrificed, to be, to be killed, to go to the cross. That God loved, so he gave. The question is, are you willing to believe that, to trust in that, and to receive the gift of eternal life?